Hello, I'm Marshall Shore, Arizona's hip historian. Today I'm joined by the Arizona State Capitol because it was recently proclaimed online to be the ugliest state capitol in America. How did that make you feel? It makes me feel mad and upset. I'm over 115 years old, older than the state itself, and those folks at that list took a pick of my bum and called it ugly. Though I've had some work done, I don't feel that they were correct nor very polite. You know, Capital, you're looking quite dapper today. <laughs> well, thank you, hip historian. I'm a humble Capital, nothing too fancy. I'm all about local. My foundation that keeps me standing here was carved from our own nearby landmark, Camelback Mountain. My top came from Yavapai County, and the ground level is granite from South Mountain. But I have to boast about my copper top. It was old and dinged up. The wonderful youth across Arizona saved their pennies to buy me a new shiny copper dome. <laughs> Thank you. Who's with you today? My children, the House and Senate. See, Arizona has grown a lot over the years. Instead of moving or getting rid of me and getting something new and fancy, they were added as needed. Some call them too modern, lacking class, but they are children of their era and show how we've grown since my territorial days. Do you like it when people come to visit? Oh, of course. I adore visitors. We're the home by and for the people. You can even get a tour of all four floors and hear the stories that make Arizona's history great. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Oh, my gosh. Have we got a great show for you this evening? Without a doubt, I am happy that this is our first show of 2021 on this lovely. It was such a beautiful day out today on January 7th. Now, I know we've got folks on Twitch, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, all over the place watching. So I want to say. Welcome to all of you. And I also want to welcome Brenda, who is with ARP, onto the screen. Hey, Brenda, how are you doing? Hi, Marshall. Good evening. Well, good evening and Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Brenda Holt. I am the Associate State Director of Community Outreach for the Arizona State Office of AARP. We are so excited that you could join us again for uh, yet another kickoff for another great season with the Arizona hip historian, Marshall Shore, for our virtual history tours. AARP's mission is to empower people to choose how they live as they age. And we understand right now that a lot of people are currently out of work. So in the month of January, we're gonna be focusing on what we call working jobs. This theme is designed to help experienced workers and job seekers get to where they want to be in the workforce. So at AARP uh, Working Jobs, you will find some tips, some great tools to jumpstart your work search. You can visit us at aarp.org work. And for other AAR e events and activities like these, these wonderful tours, you can visit us at aarp.org slash near you. And I've already placed that information in the chat feature for your future reference. So now, without further ado, I just know that you can't wait to see what Mr. Shore has in store for us tonight. <laughs> so, again, here he is, 
Hi, Mark. <laughs> Brenda, thank you so much for helping us bring in the new year and kicking us on for another year of Arizona History Happy Hour. And we've got some great stuff coming up, not just tonight, but coming up in the future. And you'll hear more about a little bit of that. So Brenda, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, dear. All right. So what can you expect on Arizona History Hour? Because I know it's like we keep gaining more and more readers, watchers. And so I think it's always kind of fun. And I always like to tell people, you know, why am I here doing this? So that's what we're going to. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who Marshall Shore is and kind of what you can expect tonight. So tonight, we're going to do a little bit of trivia. We're going to have some music history. We're going to do some show and tell. And, of course, it would not be a happy hour without a happy hour. So, without any further ado, I want to introduce myself so that way you get to know a little bit about Marshall Shore and why am I here? So, you know, actually 21 years ago, plus a few days, was my first day in Phoenix. And I had moved here from Brooklyn. I had been working in a lovely Carnegie building out in Brooklyn. And I got really sick of the cold, the slush, that bone chilling cold weather. And so it was time for a change. And I traded all that up for South Phoenix. I was working in a little 1950 library that was the first branch for Phoenix Public. And it was in a great community that had this rich oral tradition of kind of how the community got to where it was. And so that kind of got me to look around and look at my environment in a different way than just, oh, this is what it says. But there's, let's start talking about that history and how things got here. And so that's kind of one of the fundamental things kind of helped me launch what became the hip historian. Now to do all this, we loaded up everything we own into, now this is an old black and white photo, but it kind of shows you the progression of U-Hauls before they got to big trucks that used to be just little trailers that you pulled behind you. It was a family that moved here and they realized they needed to help so many other folks come here as well as across the country. And that's just what they've done. And their international hold headquarters are still right here in the Valley of the Sun. Now, when we got here, we promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. Now, when we moved in, it was oh so many horrific shades of beige. I am happy to say it is now two colors, sea foam and cantaloupe. Now, the reason why we fell in love with the house was it's a time capsule. That's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the best GE electric appliances from 1956 that match the tile. If you look, my oven has no window. So if you're baking a cake and you want to check on it, you've got to so gingerly open, but even more carefully shut that door because if you let it slam, what happens? Your cake falls. And I did that on one cake. You never do that after you do that one time. And also, if you take a look, you'll notice that push buttons for the stovetop are inset in the wall, which I think is pretty darn cool. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about was there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, whether it was on my bike, I had to throw on my tennis shoes, I had to hop in my car. I came face to face with so many amazing people, stories, places that I was like, I just started kind of capturing these stories and retelling them. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. Kind of like now, people are moving here in huge numbers. And so 
I mentioned my name is Marshall Shore, but I'm also known as the Hip Historian. Now, I got that name back in 2012. Actually, it would have been just before February 14th because that's when we were celebrating 100 years of statehood. And someone gave me 15 minutes on the main stage and in front of the state capitol to talk about anything I wanted to. And I chose talking about one of the most favorite events that had me in, I mean, I was, it just captured my interest from the moment I started hearing about it. It was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing. It was touted right up there as with Mardi Gras as something that everyone in the country should come and see. And so they gave me 15 minutes and I was able to track down three dresses from the late 30s that I was able to convince some lovely friends to don. And we spent that 15 minutes talking about the Massey Element as they were parading those amazing late 30s outfits on the stage. Now, that's kind of a lot of what I was doing, um, doing a lot of tours, lectures. And, you know, in this moment, things have drastically changed. Actually, I just did a program virtually for Maricopa County Library District for their winter reading program. So there will be information coming out about that soon. Um, normally, I would be doing bus tours, but, you know, no one's going to get on a bus with a bunch of strangers and I don't blame them. So what we started doing is we have started doing, my friend Deb and I now do walking tours of downtown kind of haunted history, looking at Fe downtown Phoenix in a whole new way. Everyone is wearing a mask. We're wearing microphones under our masks so that way everybody can hear us. And so I'm happy to say that actually Saturday's sold out. And so the next one will actually be coming up February 13th, which is just before Valentine's Day. And I think a little bird told me it's also Deb, my co-host. It's her birthday. So there might be cupcakes involved. We shall see. Now, as you're watching this, some of you may see a chat on the side of your screen. Feel free to chat things in there. You can also hit me up on Instagram. Good old fashioned email works as well. And that is hello at Hip Historian. And so you can track me down and leave me questions, comments, things like that, because that's where I find a lot of my best stories come from are people. They remember things that didn't really, might not have made it to the press or side stories that weren't at that point deemed large enough to be in the paper, but in hindsight are pretty cool stories. So please reach out and just let me know what your thoughts are. So also, if you are watching this on Facebook, you will see a share button. If you would be so inclined to click on that button so you can share and show people all the fun that we're having with Arizona history. Because we've got a humdinger of a show tonight. Now, it would not be a happy hour without a cocktail. And so tonight... We actually have one that's called Blood on the Grass because our special guest, when we when I was talking to my bartender, was like, oh, you know, he wrote a book on the Pleasant Valley Wars, that infamous grams Tewksbury feud. And we may talk a little bit about that tonight, but that's kind of where the idea of this cocktail came from, that it was basically feuding over grass and sheep. So that's why we have a little bit of lemongrass. We have a little bit of Rams Point whiskey. And so, and PJ knows how I love to make my own cocktail. So he has given me that ability and the fact that he has pre-made my cocktail. All I need to do is pour it in my glass. I mean, and look at how fancy this is. I mean, it's so funny. It's like, he even was like, you know, he even did a little brand for himself. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe that's something he, PJ needs to have. His own little PJ. Oh, and there my, the focus on my camera is all getting wonky. So, yeah. So, you know, it's really nice to be able to have a fancy cocktail where that's all you have to do. In fact, he even gave me garnish, which is a little bit of lemongrass and a kumquat. So that way... It looks like I went to someplace fancy and got myself a cocktail. 
Well, I did go to someplace fancy. I went to my house. So. All right. So here is a sip of blood on the grass. A delightful, a refreshing cocktail. A little bit of kumquat juice in there makes everything better. So. All right. So for show and tell, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite books, which I know I've mentioned in the past, but I always find it such a useful resource. And it is. Oh, and it's also the same as my green screen. So let's see if we, so it is Arizona Place Names by Will Barnes and is an alphabetical listing of towns across Arizona. And it gives you a little bit of information about that many towns. Look how many towns, that's a lot of places. I mean, look at that. I mean, and it's always kind of fascinating because it tells you kind of how the town came about. It kind of gives you a little bit of history, maybe of the name and even possibly when it was founded, maybe some of the folks that were involved with it. So it's one of my go-to sources. So I wanted to share that with you because now that it's like, you know, I normally would go to a library, but I had to wind up buying my own copy because I couldn't get to a library. And so I'm really happy to say that for this first show of the year, we have on Eduardo Pagan. So the first time I ever saw Eduardo was actually on a PBS show called History Detectives. And then it's like, you know, it's funny because we kept kind of running into each other at different events, at conferences and things like that. And then at one point I'm working down at the Pioneer Cemetery and who walks in? Eduardo and his son and his wife because there was an Eagle Scout project on the docket. And so without any further ado, let me bring on. <laughs> oh my gosh, it is so good to see you. It's good to see you too. You know, I, I was thinking back, when was the first time we met? I, I, now that you describe it, I remember it, but you know, it's just like you've always been around, right? So, uh, oh, yeah, right. You know, it's, it's so funny. It's kind of, you realize everything's like in a big cycle. It's like, wow. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I see you as part of my tribe. You're, you're a history geek, just like I am, you know? And so right. it's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're one of us. Oh, very much so. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Eduardo, because a lot of people may not know who you are. They probably weren't addicted to history detectives like I was. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, born and raised in Arizona. Um, on my mother's side, uh, we we are Yaqui Indians, uh, going all the way back. Uh, this is this is a group that is home based in in the Rio Yaqui in Sonora, uh, but there was a diaspora course, which then, of course, there's a community down in Tucson, also in, in Guadalupe in, in South Phoenix, and uh, just south of, of, um, of uh, Scottsdale, uh, which is close to where I grew up as well. So, you know, for, for me, I, I feel like I have roots that go far back in Arizona. Um, but I'll share with you something that few people know. And I just discovered this. Oh. Um, in fact, I, I feel, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I am the 12th great grandson of Christopher Columbus. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, I it's literally, I mean, just like 24 hours ago, I discovered this and spent this time. Well, or maybe it's 48 hours, but anyway, spent this time just trying to go through the records to try and verify this chain and it all seems to check out. So yeah, it's a long twisted and complicated story. But I know. It's like, yeah. I mean, that's quite an interesting. Now, how did you discover that through? Was it do through it through like the DNA tests that a lot of folks are doing now? Or? Um, so I, I use ancestry uh, com quite a bit in my research because uh, it, it has access to lots of databases that are out there and saves a lot of time and money, quite honestly, in doing and doing research. And I, you know, I got this this link in the, the email that said something like, um, you know, are you related to royalty or something like that? And, you know, I always just like, no, I'm not. You know, I know I'm not. 
Uh, and just on a lark, before I, I deleted it, I clicked it. And uh, that's when I, I found this connection. And, and as I said, as far as I can, I can verify from, from documents, it seems to be legitimate. So there we are. I'm not sure how I feel about this. I was going to say, I'm like, <laughs> kind of a little feuding yourself for Columbus Day. I know, that's right. Or Who Indigenous People's Day. It's like, well, which do you celebrate? It's like, family or not? Yeah. Wow, what a, what a quandary. It's all family. That's 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 interesting. Well, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're all human. We're all family. So, yes, there exactly. you go. Yeah. So otherwise, my, my daytime gig is I'm, I'm a professor of history at Arizona State University. Uh, and I'm also um, a curator of history at the Desert Caballeros Western Museum in Wickenburg. So I got oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic museum, by the way. I love it. It is. And there's good ice cream in that town. I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff to do in I good mean, I'll tell you that. Desert Hot Springs is not far from there. So yeah. lots yeah, of great the, things to do yeah, up there. Yeah, the, the connection between Wickenburg and, and Phoenix is is a fascinating connection that I I think uh, a lot of people don't know about, but I would go so far as to argue that Phoenix exists because of Wickenburg. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'll tell you the story later on as we go through our. Well, yeah. Cause I mean, it's like, I mean, I know it's like, what was it? Jack Swilling's like first house. Yeah. 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 But it's not Jack. It's not Jack. It's Henry Wickenburg. But like I said, I'll tell you the story. We okay, very good. Well, I look forward. I mean, we're going to have so many stories. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is going to be such a fun show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now we're getting ready for trivia. Now, I okay. So I do see a lot of people saying, hey, you know, what was the name of that book? So it is Arizona Place Names by Barnes. Yeah. I'm not going to type it in the chat because it does something wonky when I start typing in the chat. So I'm not going to go down that path. But I'm happy to share it also at the end of the program. People want to see a better photo of it. So when we do trivia, I like to say what I do is edutainment, that you're having so much fun, you don't realize that you're even learning. And so we have a bunch of trivia questions. We're going to go through those. They're all multiple choice. So even if you don't have a clue as to the answer, you can take a guess. And you know, some of them, you might have a really good shot of guessing if you just kind of go, well, that's not possible. That's not possible. And so, and even if you get it wrong, you know, you're, I will ask at the end what your score is, but you could lie. You could say anything and no one's going to bat an eye, but it's not how much you come in knowing, but what we're going to do is Eduardo and I are going to go through those answers and really explain them to you. So you're going to walk out of here tonight knowing so much more than when you came in. And so that's really, for me, that's the fun of this is that we get that chance to really kind of explore Arizona through so many different lenses. So now you can keep track, you can keep track of the trivia. I know some people do it in the chat. Some people do it. I actually had somebody who sent me a photo of them keeping it on a Sharpie on their leg. Whatever you're comfortable with. If it's a grease pencil on a hoagie or I guess mustard or something, have at it. Whatever makes you happy, you go. All right. So we're getting ready for our first question. Okay. All right. First, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a little blood on the grass. <laughs> to lubricate those vocal cords. Okay, question number one. Why are there not more Spanish missions in Arizona? A, the territory, the terrain was too daunting for Spanish settlers. B, the Arizona Indians were well-armed, organized, and very resistant to Spanish missionizing. C, Spain had difficulty attracting or compelling colonists to the area or D Spain could never conquer Arizona Indians, but only by their cooperation. Now, not buy in here, but in terms of trading things like that for the cooperation. So which one of those do you think is the answer? So go ahead and lock in your final answer. 
So Marshall, while people are marching are, are marking their answer, can I just jump in real? I get this question often, uh, the term Indians. Why do I use the term Indians? Um, one of my, before I came to back home to Arizona, I, I worked in Washington, D.C. with the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I, one of, part of my, my portfolio was to work with tribal colleges. And I, I visited many of them. I, not all of them, but, but certainly many of them. And one of the things that stood out to me was that the most common term that I heard at the tribal colleges on the reservations was the term Indian. Uh, it wasn't Native American. It wasn't uh, First Nations. Uh, it wasn't Indigenous. Uh, Indian was a term that I heard on the reservations. So um, I use that term uh, as well because this is the term that that uh, my my Native colleagues use as well. So just to explain that, every once in a while people ask me, well, why do you use that term? And it's because it's the term that I, I've heard most often on reservations. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Question two. How many reservations does Arizona have? A, five, B, 12, C, 20, or D, 22? How many reservations does Arizona have? All right. Moving on to question three. And places. All right. Oh. There you go. Oh. <laughs> I did something. I didn't know I had done that. I guess. Oh, I said I didn't do that purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh no, where's the question? <laughs> All right. So question three. Where did the Salt River get its name? A, the Spanish settlers first named it Rio Salado. B, the river flows over large salt deposits near the Fort Apache Reservation. C, it was originally named a salt river by the early American settlers who were repeated after repeated Indian attacks. Or D, it was named after the white caps in the river turbulence that many settlers described as white as salt. So one of those is why is how the Salt River got its name. Those could all be plausible. All right. So I'll give you a moment because there there's a lot to kind of go through. So I'll let you kind of take a look at those. All right. Oh, so are they're all going to do this. All right. Well, there you go then. Why is Grand Avenue so named? It was a, it was the wealth corridor between the Vulture Mine and Phoenix. B, it was originally planned after the Grand Boulevards of Paris. C, it was named for Eliezer Grand a West Valley farmer who donated the land for the road. Or D, it was the longest stretch of road in the territorial period. So one of those is how Grand Avenue got its name. Maybe I should jump in here for just a moment and say there could be more than one that... <laughs> Okay. Well, right. And you know, and you know, and that's kind of par for the course with our trivia. Is it's usually there are kind of curveballs here and there. So that's kind of the fun of you know, sometimes there's not one right answer. Correct. Yeah. All right. So moving on to question five, which is going to be medicinal. And this was fascinating. Oh, but yep, and they're all going to be doing this. Okay. Where did Bethany Home get its name? A, Bethany Home was a school for unwed mothers. B, Bethany Home was the informal name of the Arizona Territorial Asylum. C, Bethany Home was one of Frank Lloyd Wright's designs. D, Bethany Home was a tuberculosis clinic run by Missionary Church Association. All right, so how did Bethany Home get its name? Oh, and I guess we're back to <laughs> now. You might have to hop in here for some of these pronunciations because. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we're we'll just say a, and we'll leave it at that. So okay, what medicinal crop 
did 19th century investors try to raise in Arizona? A, Coco. Because <laughs> I'm not going to try to withdraw Roxmalam, Oxymala, Oxylum. So it sounds like a modern drug. All right. B, Papaver Soniferium or? Somniferum. Yeah, that's good. Somniferum. Okay. C, Willow Trees. Or D, Cannabis Sativa. Which one of those did early investors try to raise right here in Arizona? And now we get into the infamous five C's, the, the historical five C's. That's right. There, there's, all this, uh, there's all this talk about what the new C's are. So since some of the old C's aren't quite as valid as they once were open, I guess we're back to this. Why is Pima Cotton so named? The Akimal Odom P or Pima cultivated long staple cotton before the coming of the Americans. It is short for the scientific classification. Gossipium. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm going to say a dirty word if I try to pronounce that last one. So I will pass. <laughs> C, the cotton was raised on USDA experimental farms on the Gila River Pima Reservation in the early 1900s. Or D, the cotton was named after Pima County. Which one of those gave its name to Pima Cotton? Where were the corporate headquarters of Clifton's Arizona Copper Company located? A, Chicago. B, London. C, Edinburgh. Or D, New York City. Where, did Cli where was the headquarters for Clifton's Arizona Copper Company? All right. Now we get to talk about some people. What was Winston Churchill's connection to Jerome? He liked a winner at the Grand Hotel. He was the only prime minister of England to have visited Jerome. C. Churchill's father, Lord Randolph Henry Spencer Churchill, was a principal investor in the Jerome's mine. Or D. Eugene Jerome was a first cousin to Jenny Jerome, Lady Randolph Churchill or Winston Churchill's mom. Which one of those connections links Winston Churchill and Jerome? And Deb, don't give it away for everybody. <laughs> All right. How did Del Webb get his start as a developer? His father was a developer. Dumb luck, B. C, he leveraged land that he inherited from his parents. Or D, he was a land speculator. All right, question 11. What single housing development changed Arizona history? A, Sun City. B, the Biltmore. C, the Wigwam. Or D, Goodyear. Which one of those housing developments changed Arizona history? And we do a little bit of top politics. What took Arizona so long to become a state? It was too wild and uncivilized, A. Eh? B, it was too dangerous. C, it did not have a sufficient population base. Or D, it was too po politically progressive. 
All right. So while you're figuring out your answers and maybe before you take a bite of your sandwich, writing them down someplace else, whatever. So, you know, just bear with us for a moment. We're going to do a little bit of Arizona music history. And after that, we'll come back with the answers. Now with Arizona music history, um, I don't have the rights to much music. So guess what? We actually don't play music for Arizona music history. I'm actually trying to figure something out um, if I can get word from the artists that I can play their music, then I can do that. But I have no copyright. So we are going to talk about Calexico. But you can you can hum a few bars, right, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I sound good in the shower. <laughs> okay. When I do karaoke, which I don't mind doing, they don't play it back when I'm done because it's that painful. Take a few more swigs of your drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll just be swinging away. That's right. So Calexico is a band from Tucson. Their <laughs> core members are Joey Burns and John Covertino. They kind of came into their own after playing with some other bands in 96. They released their first album. And then they basically started kind of playing with some other mainstays such as folks like Nico Case that are part of the Arizona music scene. Their music style has been influenced from traditional Latin sounds of mariachi, cumbia, tejano, and mixed with country, jazz, post-rock, a little bit of everything. Now the band's name actually does come from the border town of Calexico. California and their style of have music has been named by many as desert noir. They've got over a dozen albums. They've worked on at least one soundtrack for a movie. And you know, it was so funny when I moved to Arizona, I had heard of Calexico. I then had the opportunity to actually travel to Vienna. So I'm in this little kind of arty cafe in Vienna and what suddenly pops on, not just the speakers, but when I go to check out and pay for my the trinkets and things that I bought, they were selling Calexico CD in Vienna, which I didn't realize at that point they had such an international reach, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, they do have some music you can listen to on Spotify, on a wide variety of sources. Um, I also did list their website there if you kind of want to go on and see kind of what they're doing now. Their latest album was actually Christmas music or holiday music. So if you're still in the holiday spirit, you might want to do that. One of the most critically acclaimed albums was actually Calexico, The Black Light. So there you go. All right. So now we're getting ready for some answers and the fun is soon to ensue. All right. So Eduardo, why are there not some more Spanish missions right here in Arizona? So I have to apologize and confess that this one is a, is a trick question in if, for this reason is that they're all correct. Ah, that's, that's, there wasn't just one reason, but um, there are many reasons. Um, part of the reason why Spain had such difficulty in, in recruiting or inducing settlers to go further north than Tucson was it because of all of the the uh, very well organized and, and well armed uh, native communities that lived in uh, north of Tucson, basically north of the Santa Cruz River. Um, so there, all of all of those answers were correct about why Spain didn't have more of a presence in Arizona. They could only manage a, a toehold, um, and just just south of Tucson, quite honestly. Um, uh, eventually, uh, Tucson as well, but that was about it. And everything else they tried any further north was destroyed by raiding uh, raiding communities, Apaches, Navos, Donawatham as well. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. all of the above. Yeah. Very good. And so, oh, and some people actually got that right. They wrote them all down. So, yeah, but it doesn't matter what you wrote down because it's kind of like a free space. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, here's just, I mean, it's like, I mean, I love like San Javier yeah. as well as then Tucum Cori. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like kind of like that different ends of the spectrum of one that's been refurbished and looks beautiful right. versus more likely what they found when they walked into. Right. 
right. San Javier. Right, and there were missions that were attempted over in Yuma as well, and they were completely wiped out by by a coalition of native communities that didn't didn't want to allow the Spanish presence any further than San Javier del Bac. So, yeah, that's and what I wanted to show with this particular map is that you know looking at Arizona, that's the furthest north that uh, Spanish missionaries could could get was really in the Tucson area. And, and the other thing I want to point out is that, is that there are large expanses where there was no Spanish presence whatsoever. And it was largely because of the native communities that, that occupied and controlled those areas. That makes sense. Yeah, so I mean, just a few more graphs. There's, there's a line graph just kind of like that's just the furthest north that they went. Just hit, so hit the keyboard one more time. Ah, uh, there we go. There you go, and one more time as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. And so, you know, it, just to show you that that this was an empty land, this was well occupied land. Um, right. You, know, you had mentioned earlier uh, in coming out to Arizona, um, I kind of had the, this uh, a similar kind of experience. Now, of course, I, I'm, I'm born here, born and raised here. But uh, when I went back east to study in graduate school, you know, people would I'd have friends come and visit me and they would say, oh, there's so much history here. And for me, Arizona is this place of tremendous antiqu antiquity. I mean, it's it's almost like Middle Earth, right? Like these ancient communities that have been here for thousands of years, and and their their ruins are still around, and their descendants are still around. And and my my point in saying this is is that you know we sometimes we tend to look at a map like this and and think that was all uh, just blank land, and it wasn't. There were people living there, and they've been living there for generations, for thousands of years. So. Just to give you an idea, that's why the, you know, those large circles that I've got there, um, there were lots of people there, and and they were well organized, and they were very resistant to Spanish missionizing. And in fact, I'll point out one other thing: uh, the California coast. I'm sure you're familiar with El Camino Real, which goes from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco. Those missions were only along the coast; they couldn't get any further into the California. Uh, uh, in California is because of the native communities there that were very, very resistant to Spanish missionizing. So, yeah. So again, this is all to say that this is, this is a place of great antiquity. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's always surprising. It's like, I mean, I think because such of the history in so many cases is, is buried, you have to dig for it literally. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think as well as, you know, as Americans, uh, Americans tend to think that history started when the United States established a presence. And in fact, no, human history goes way back in this in this land. It's interesting to think about Arizona as this very layered uh, place uh, where many different people made their mark, and many of them are still here, right? Yeah, I mean that's one thing that I love. Like the the Pioneer Cemetery downtown yeah. was built on top of a Native American village, yeah. so it's like as you're walking around, you will find pottery shards that two days ago weren't there that have somehow worked their way up to the surface. Right. Yeah. And whenever we do tours or anything, we always tell people, it's like, you know, you can look, you can pick it up and look at it, but you do not want to take that bad mojo with you. Leave it right where you found it. Yes. 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 And so, yeah, I mean, I, but that's, I think one of the best examples of just this whole layering upon layering. Mm -hmm. and so, in fact, I would just just add one other thing as well is that one of the things that Phoenix owes its its history to its its founding was really to the native communities, uh, the Maricopa, the Hachidon Pipash uh, that lived along the uh, the Salt River. They protected this fledgling community of Phoenix in the 1870s from the from the the more powerful raiding economies uh, that were in place uh, again from the Apaches, from the Navajos as well. And were 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 it not for that buffer. Uh, Phoenix would have been wiped off the map. So, and, and, and to go a little bit further is that the first roads were laid by native and Latino workers, you know? So, you know, we, Phoenix and the metropolitan area of Phoenix, there's this base that builds off the native presence and they're still here. I mean, that's the thing is they haven't gone away, right? They're, they're all right. part of the mix, but yeah, Phoenix owes a lot to, uh, and, and not just when I mean Phoenix, I mean the Salt River Valley. I mean, owes a lot to the native communities. Right. I mean, that's how we got our name Phoenix is basically those canals that they discovered when yeah. they got here that had been built by the indigenous folks. Yeah. Suddenly it was like, it was all about that civilization rising up from the ashes of another civilization. 
And you know, what's fascinating to contemplate is that those canals were over a couple hundred miles collectively of, of human made rivers. For what purpose? It was to grow things. The, the Salt River Valley was, was kind of the, the breadbasket of this area. Um, and they grew cotton and squash and beans. And there was, this was a fertile area. And that means there were a lot of people living here and there was highly organized communities, you know, and, and uh, those canals just don't happen by accident. It requires organization and vision. And, oh, and, right. and, and mathematics, I mean, and all these different, how do you, how do you get water from here to there? I yeah. mean, you got to have a very under, very much understanding of almost geometry without even knowing geometry of how do you make this happen? Right. Right. Yeah. Even, even the freestanding structures that still are, are in existence today, think of the Casa Grande uh, uh, ruins or Besh Begoa down out by, by Globe. Uh, yeah. Marvel at their architectural and engineering knowledge that out of rocks and dirt and sticks, they were able to make multi-story buildings that are still standing to this day. I, I, I honestly marvel at that. So yeah, they were very sophisticated. They were indeed. Wow. So, all right. All right, so how many reservations does Arizona have? The answer is C. 20. 20. As a matter of fact, Arizona has the most amount of acreage devoted to reservations in the nation. We and, yeah, So the Navajo Nation actually is the largest reservation that exists, but um, we have a very, uh, in terms of land base, a large native presence. I think Oklahoma can compete with us in terms of numbers, uh, but certainly in terms of land base, we, we have a, a very strong presence. Yeah, and, and it's all over the state. And it's kind of just one thing of it. Oh, it yes. yeah. Let me, let me, let me unplug that. Oh. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. All right. So, all right. All right, the Salt oh River, yes, yes, the Salt River. So this is interesting. And, and thank you for putting this other map as well, is that the Salt River actually gets its name because uh, it's the confluence of two different rivers uh, over by the Apache Reservation in the, uh, the east of Arizona. And the waters actually go by salt flats which made the water itself by the time it came into the Salt River area, it, it had a, a salty, taste to it. I wouldn't say it's as salty as seawater. Obviously, I haven't tasted it uh, back at, back in colonial days, but uh, there are no reports that it was it was not drinkable. But yeah, that's where it gets its name, actually. was. And the uh, some people might wonder about the first option about the Spanish naming it Rio Salado, and that certainly was one of the, the names. Uh, the Salt River itself, in Eng uh, Americans gave it probably about 20 different names, the Black River, the Bear River, I mean, lots of different names before we finally settled on the Salt River. Ah. Um, but the Salt River itself, I, if I remember correctly, I think some of the native communities that lived along the river called it Salt River in their tongue. So ah, this okay. what the first name it, Rio Salada. They were simply, Again, as they asked their 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 guides, or or as they came across communities, like, what do you call this thing? And and so this this is where they then came the name uh, came up with the name Rio Salado. But it's for that reason, is it because it, it ran past salt salt flats and gave it a kind of salty taste? Oh wow! Very cool. All right, Grand Avenue. Indeed, it is a grand avenue. Oh. I mean, the fact that it cuts a cry it out of a city of a grid, I mean, it's that only 45 degree angle street. Right, right. So we were talking earlier about Wickenburg and the reason why Phoenix, Phoenix exists and it owes its existence to Wickenburg. Um, Wicken up in Wickenburg uh, was the Vulture Mine. And the Vulture Mine, I believe, was the most productive gold mine in Arizona and Arizona's history. The problem with uh, Wickenburg, there were, in fact, at, at its peak, there were 2,000 miners up in the Wickenburg area. There's no farmland. 
it's it's mountain and it's rocky and it's dry, right? I mean, there, there's no farmland. It's, you've got 2,000 people, you've got a fee. So Henry Wickenberg had a problem. And it was Jack Swilling, you'd mentioned it before. Jack Swilling came up with this cockamamie idea that that he had that had hit him earlier as he had scouted around uh, in, in the Salt River Valley and, and came across these Hohokam uh, canals. He had this idea that if, if they could somehow clear out the canals that had been clogged up by, what, about four centuries of, of, date, of desert scrub, they could clear it out, they could they could create these canals that would then reinvigorate the Salt River Valley, right? And he proposed a scheme to Henry Wickenburg and Wickenburg went for it. And so he underwrote the Swilling Canal Company and Jack Swilling then got his start in Phoenix, but it was all to be able to feed the miners up in Wickenburg. So Grand Avenue was the connection between Phoenix and Wickenburg. So the, the gold came down from Wickenburg to purchase supplies and goods from the farming community of Phoenix and Peoria and Alhambra, right? They're all along that, that diagonal grid. They were all started as farming communities to feed the miners up in Wickenburg. And, and that's where the wealth began to uh, flow down into these, these tiny communities at the time. We're talking a couple hundred people uh, back in the uh, 1870s. Uh, I think I, 250, if I remember, 1877 was, um, was a census that was taken at Phoenix. And there were about 250 people there. Um, but they were they were agricultural communities. In fact, Peoria gets its name because of farmers that were recruited from Peoria, Arizona. I'm sorry, Il Illinois. That's where it gets oh. its name. Buckeye. Buckeye from settlers from the Buckeye State, right? So yeah, there was there was a, a vested interest on the part of developers in Arizona to uh, to make the desert blossom. Uh, and to to grow things, and and that's why farmers were recruited out to this area. But they needed money, so yeah. So Grand Avenue was actually that cash corridor, but at the same time, as you pointed out, it's the longest stretch uh, in the territory. In fact, I think we've got a map that kind of shows you that. Mm -hmm. um, this this map is a is a map that that it, now it's a grid map, and it shows where all the Holocom canals are. Uh, but it gives you an idea, you know, the, the, the metropolitan Phoenix area is laid out in a grid anyway. So it kind of gives you an idea of how our, what our streets look like. But that road it was the longest road in the territory. And it went all the way up to Wickenburg. So it's one of the reasons why it was named Grand Avenue. And and now, I mean, and now it's like the epicenter of the art scene from that kind of that 7th Avenue stop to the start of it to really about 15th Avenue. I mean, there's so much arts going along there. Hey, listen, I got to drop this on you. So I don't know if we have time to cover this, but uh, there were stories about Grand Avenue being haunted by, by the men who had been killed. Now, so think about this. So you've got wagons of gold coming down from Wickenburg, um, and a lot of bad actors knew that. And so they would lay in wait to attack the, the wagons. And there were stories that found their way into the Arizona Republic back then it was the Arizona Republican, um, about, about um, uh, stage drivers who would swear that they saw apparitions along the trail. And they, they, surmised, they, were, they surmised it was probably people had been killed. Uh, and there were ambushes, right? You know, as, as the gold was, was trapped. Right. I'm sure people were looking for a way to make money quick. Exactly. Exactly. And there are stories of hauntings along uh, Grand Avenue. Wow. Now I do want to pop on um, Karen's got a comment that her great, great grandfather owned the vulture mine at one point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Henry Wickenberg sold it. Um, and I don't recall the date, but he sold it at, at one point. Um, and I know it passed hands, but you know, from, from the point that it left Wickenberg, I, I haven't traced who else had it, but that's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's a great, your, what was a great great grandfather? If I remember correctly, I mean he yeah. he was instrumental in 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 the growth of Phoenix and the metropolitan area. I mean he was part of that story. So that's that's a great history. Yeah, and and um, the Volter Mine part of it is still is now actually being actively mined again, yeah. but there are parts of it you can actually tour now. Yeah, and you can also do ghost tours. Indeed, you can. 
Yeah. So I, I know, I know Deb has done a couple of those up there. So, you know, I find it fascinating. I've just, you know, just got to share you on this theme. I, you know, just as, as, as two historians, I find it fascinating how places have memories and not only do they have memories, but they connect with people almost in the subconscious brain. Um, and it's fascinating to me that how many historic places people have stories of sounds that continue or feelings that continue or even sightings that continue. And, and I, I, again, I just find this fascinating, this connection between memory and experience and place. I don't, you know, as, as, a, as a social scientist, I don't have a, I don't have an, a, an answer for that about why, but I acknowledge that it's there and, and it's, it's common. And I find that fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we actually talk about um, on our second Saturday ghost tours is there are some spaces that as they change, the energy still does its same thing in that same space. So even now there may be apartments in that space. The woman still dances through the walls. I could share you a couple stories, honestly, of uh, speaking of energy that um, I have no rational scientific explanation for other than I know what I experienced. Right. So, yeah, it's it's interesting stuff. Indeed, it is. We should do a ghost. We should do a ghost, uh, a ghost hour at some point. Oh, that would be fun. Actually, no, we should do that in October. Yes, absolutely. That would be a blast. All right. So where did Bethany home get its name? So it was uh, it, Bethany home was actually a, a tuberculosis facility that was run by the missionary church association. So it was a, it was a Christian uh, tuberculosis center. Uh, and the point is, go ahead and pull up the, the next slide is, is that a lot of folks don't realize that part of what drew people to the Arizona territory in the 19th century and early 20th century as well was the, the, was tuberculosis and tuberculosis um one of the common, they didn't have any remedies, but one of the, uh, the uh, prescriptions was that it was where the people needed to dry their lungs out. And so Arizona at the time, uh, before our artificial lakes uh, changed our, our humidity, uh, yeah, it was a pollution. Yes. Yeah. It, a place of, 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 hum of dry weather. Right. And so a lot of tuberculosis uh, patients came out here, which also facilitated the growth of Phoenix. Uh, the healthcare industry was one of the first industries in the metropolitan area. And so I actually had two slides for you. One was. You did. Uh, I mean, you've, you've got the, the various types of exactly. sanitariums. I mean, you have the very lux where it's brick and then you wind up with the very other version. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so, well, it's interesting. So um, I had a friend who recently just passed. He was in his mid nineties mm -hmm. and we had talked about sunny slope and how that had been tent city. Yeah. And then he piped in and said, well, you know, that's what we used to call Scottsdale was tent city. Yes. yes and sure. like, most people don't realize it's like, and so most people don't realize that there were tent cities all over the place. That's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. All right. So what medicinal crop did 19th century investors try to raise here in Arizona? Uh, opium poppies. Opium, opium poppies. poppies. So it would have looked like Wizard of Oz. There would have just been this big field of poppies. Right. Exactly. So I've got to tell you, in fact, this is a, this is a book that I'm working on now is about the drug culture of the Old West uh, that was hiding in plain sight. Uh, in the, the 19th century, particularly after the Civil War, hard drugs were sold over the counter. So we're talking heroin, cocaine, morphine. Uh, opium, of course, was available through uh, any number of, of uh, Chinese uh, workers who had opium dens that were frequented by, by lots of people. But yeah, there was, there was very active discussion in the, uh, the 1870s, 1880s by investors of trying to make Arizona the opium producing capital of the United States. Wow. Because, because of our climate, and the plan was to grow them along uh, the Colorado River, but that was the goal. It was going to be the cash crop, just like cotton was the cash crop in the in the South. In Arizona, it was going to be opium. Now, the idea never actually took off, and I'm not exactly sure why, because 
again, these these products were over the counter and were not regulated until uh, the 1920s. Uh, so I'm talking about you know morphine, which is a derivative of opium, and uh, heroin, if I remember correctly, is a derivative of morphine. They're all they're all synthetics of of, of opium. So I don't know why it didn't take off, but there was there was active discussion by investors. You could read about it in the newspapers, extolling the virtues of of opium and and contributing to the Arizona economy and on and on and on. So now, okay, so you brought up a good point in terms of the research of it was talked about in the newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Now back in, I mean, not that long ago, if you were trying to research something through a newspaper, you literally had to go page by page no. or on microfish. No. Yeah. How has that changed? Oh my, that's a great question. So the Library of Congress has a website called chroniclingamerica.org. Uh, so it's L-O-C chroniclingamerica.org. Uh, and it's a database where they have uh, digitized a number of newspapers going all the way back, as early as they can, depending, of course, on the state, right? So our Arizona newspapers uh, really don't go back any uh, earlier than the Civil War. Um, but it's a great resource. You can type in any name or any subject and pull up all the hits of the of the newspapers uh, that published, uh, you know, on, on that topic or on that individual. And in some cases you can actually, if you're doing genealogical work, you can trace your ancestor uh, because newspapers, uh. they, they operated like uh, you know, hometown rags. You know, they would they would literally say things like like Marshall Shore has gone on vacation and he'll be gone for two weeks. Right, and they would tell you where you're going, and then and then they would like, oh, and now he's back home. How exciting! Yes, and so you could you could almost follow people because they would just report on anything, right? So anyway, it's a fantastic resource that I use quite a bit to try and at least understand the reading culture that existed in the 19th century. And you know, you know, people are as as newspapers. I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that they're infallible in terms of of their accuracy, but at least you understand what people were reading and thinking about, right? And, and it gives you a window in a world that is oh, no- Very longer. much so. I mean, suddenly you can now keyword search things that would have taken you years yes. to find one article. Yes. Now you can find it in a matter of minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, back in the well, old days, you go down to the archives, right? And, and read through the microfilm, but now uh, it's, it's great. And, and because it's online, you can zoom in and, you know, and, and look at a word and try to figure it out or, you know, there are lots right. of things you can do now. Yeah. Which is really exciting. Yeah. Also, so why is Pima Cotton named Pima Cotton? It has nothing to do with the town of Watham. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no, no. It was, well, I shouldn't say nothing. So the USDA, exper USDA experimental farms were on the Gila River Pima Reservation, and this extra long staple cotton was uh, was grown on these uh, farms, and the USDA uh, named it after the Pima, um, as they were called back then, uh, just in honor of the location. But that was it. That it, it's not uh, it's not kind of uh, native grown cotton that you know that competed with Egyptian cotton, for example. It was uh, it was just cultivated by the USDA DA, and uh, on that topic, I would also add this as well: is that uh, the reason why we have palm trees in in Arizona is because the USDA was looking to foster a domestic date growing industry, and experimented with transplanting dates all throughout. Uh, either there were date farms. Do you remember them oh, when you that's like so that's like the black sphinx dates up in arcadia which are still around yeah. the only, so we're propagated the only place on the planet where those black dates black sphinx dates grow right and then dateland uh, further out if you take uh, interstate 8 oh out, my gosh love dateland and they always stop for i mean sadly they've remodeled it so it's all fancy and right. looks right. about 1985 as right. opposed to 1957 which was much cooler uh, personally yeah, but it's still a great stop. Uh, and but nonetheless, I mean, it's all because the USDA invested in Arizona in in trying to uh, build up the, the domestic economy, either in dates or cotton as well. So, oh, and I, I want to give a shout out to Anita. Thank you, Anita, so much for throwing out. Somebody was asking what was that link for Chronicle America. Yes, so she just posted that in the chat session. That is such an amazing site for yes. so much. 
now that I see it, I realize I misremembered it entirely. So, That's okay. I mean, well, you know, I mean, I, I usually don't remember exactly what it is. I just, it's either bookmarked or I just kind of like, depending yeah. on, I, I've done it on my phone before, which is kind of fascinating. You can be on the road and be like, okay, here's something. What can I find on it? Right. So, yeah. I mean, I've used it on the road a lot. Thank you, Anita, for putting that up. Indeed. Thank you, Anita. All right. And so where was the corporate headquarters for Clifton, Arizona Copper Company? Edinburgh, which I find so fascinating was, was it that uh, Scottish uh, investors, literally from Scotland, right? Uh, Scottish investors. Uh, and, and they sent some of their, their men to be the, the mine bosses as well out to Clifton uh, down, down in southeastern Arizona. Um, they contribute again uh, to the development of the copper industry in Arizona. And, but I find it fast, so fascinating that investors in Edinburgh, in Scotland, right? They were they were investing in Arizona and helping develop the industry. Well, and Clifton, I mean, it's such a beautiful town. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what they say in Clifton. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, but you know, it was so funny. So I, I did a program several years ago in Clifton yeah. and it's like, and I, you know, it's like, I'm probably not going to get to Clifton again. I tried, but, and it was like, and I was like, well, what should I go see while I'm here? And so they're giving me directions to someone's house in a valley. And oh. I'm like, and it's like, it's those country directions that I give as well. It's like, well, you, you know, you go up here and next to the yellow bird, you turn left and at the blue bird, then you turn right. And then you go through the, the circle and you take the third exit. And I'm like, I'm never going to get where I'm supposed to go. And this woman says, I will drive you. So we go out to this valley and she's like, I come out here yearly and just take a panoramic photo of all around. Cause she's like, see those beautiful mountains. I'm like, yeah. She's like, see those gray, dark masses in the background. She's like, those were mountains and they were mined. And so now they're dead. Yeah. And she's like, and at some point those will be gone and then they will start on the beauty that the, the eliminating the last bit of beauty in Clifton. Yeah. And so it was so interesting to kind of hear that double-edged sword of in order to keep the town of live, you've got to kill it. Right. Right. You know, Clifton is an interesting place. It, it was, it was always a mining town. And uh, because it was a mining town, uh, they went to where the loads were. And the loads were found in pretty rugged and, and desolate country. Um, and it's interesting when you go there now. At one time, it was a, it was a thriving and bustling town. Uh, you go there now, there, there are a lot of buildings that have been uh, vacant for quite some time. But you, you can still see this 19th century architecture. Very much so. so yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a fascinating place. Uh, but I got to tell you, again, having grown up in, in the Sonoran Desert, where we're used to a lot of vegetation, I, I looked around and I thought, wow, there are a lot of rocks here. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right. So what was Winston Churchill's connection to Jerome? So, yeah. So Eugene Jerome was the first cousin to Jenny Jerome uh, and the Jerome family. hence the name of uh, the town Jerome, right? Uh, they were financiers uh, in New York City. I don't know that, that any of them ever came out to Jerome, actually, but the town was named after them. And uh, it helped kind of go into the coffers of the family fortune, which then set up Lady Randolph uh, to become one of these buccaneers, as they were called, these Americans who went to England in search of, uh, of, of someone who had a title to marry. And so Jenny Jerome was um, was Lady Randolph uh, Churchill uh, was Winston Churchill's mother. She was an American, right? That was the connection. I mean, it's it's a little tangential, but it's you know, a little tangential. But even but even the town Jerome has it on their own website and everything else. It's like oh, here's this Churchill connection. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. Right, and well, you know, and it's so funny because when I first started kind of doing the stuff that I'm doing here in Phoenix, it's like you quickly realize it was like three degrees of separation unlike everywhere else was six it was like everybody seemed to have a connection to everybody i mean yeah. and in some ways that's still kind of true it's still very much this small town that got big yeah yeah and so all right and how did dell webb get his start as a developer that all is right. so true dumb luck so i gotta tell you this this i'll try and make a long story very short but uh it was the westward ho hotel 
uh, when it had started, uh, it, the, the builders went bankrupt. And so it sat uh, um, unfinished for, for a while. And some more investors came in, uh, then finished the Western Hotel. And Del Webb was actually a carpenter who came out to Arizona because he had contracted some lung condition. I don't think it was tuberculosis. He was, he was actually from the Bay Area. But again, it was one of these situations where he was told by his doctor that, you know, to get better, you need to dry your lungs out. And so he came to Phoenix. He was just a carpenter. And uh, it was on opening night, 1929, as you recall, the Westbrook Hotel, that, that um, our, before the hotel opened, the, the, uh, the owner assembled all the workers and said, we need to have someone on site just in case there are last minute re repairs. Does anyone have a suit? Del Webb was the only guy who raised his hand and said, well, I, I've got a suit. All right. I want you here on opening night. Well, as it turned out, uh, there were some, uh, some grocers who were invited VIPs on opening night walking around. They were looking at the, the, you know, the architecture and the, the beauty of that place, very impressed. Mm -hmm. uh, asked, well, you know, who, to, can I get in touch with some of these workers? Because um, I'm trying to remember whether it was the, the bashes or not. I don't remember which grocer, local grocer it was. But they had some some projects they needed to have completed, and so so this grocer then asked Dell, said, "Look, can you get some guys together? I've got I've got a store that you know uh, isn't finished, and the workers took off. Can you get some guys together and, and, and finish this this grocery store?" Well, that's how the Dell Warp Reb Corporation started. So he then built grocery stores and then put in a bid to build Luke Air Force Base. And then it just, the whole thing started to, to spin off at that point. Yeah, but it all had out. a suit. Yeah, it all started because he, he was the only guy that had a suit. Dumb luck, right? Yeah. Right. See, that's the, why you, you should always have a suit because you never know exactly. when it will come in handy. Yes, yes. Dress for success. <laughs> All right. What was a single housing development that changed Arizona history? Now, I put up Sin City, and, and we could have an interesting conversation to, about this, but I, speaking of Del Webb, uh, I put up Sun City because Sun City initiated the retirement community industry. Uh, it was established in 1960, and, and when it was just an idea that Del Webb had. And, you know, on, on opening day, they had no idea whether anyone would show up. You know, they expected a couple hundred people. They had some balloons out, maybe some brownies or something like that. And over a thousand people show up to Sun City, this, this idea. And, and it started the whole retirement community industry. And now the reason why it changed Arizona history is because it brought out tons of folks from the Midwest. Kind of like, I know you're not from the Midwest, but people- Actually, wanted, I am. Originally, I am from the Midwest. So I grew up in Indiana. So- Who wanted to get away from this, from all the snow and the cold weather. Right. And so doing- they actually altered the political history of Arizona. It's one of the reasons why Maricopa is a red county where Pima County is a blue county right. and uh, Coconino County is a, is a blue county as well, but Maricopa is a red county. And because this is, there's so many retirees that live in this, this, in this county alone, that's what then tips the politics in Arizona. So that's why I would argue that Sun City was was the most significant uh, development because it shaped the future, the political future of Arizona, who we elect, how we identify as a state, all of that. Yeah, I mean, when I first moved here, I, when I was working in South Phoenix, um, became friends with a gentleman who had been really involved with the ACLU back in the day and was really talking about how this place had been very blue and then had had slowly or not so slowly changed to red, right? And it, I I would mark that with a nineteen six with nineteen sixty the development of Sun City, and uh, just the growth of the valley of, of a lot of people coming from more conservative uh, places in in the nation, coming out here and um, having an impact on state politics. Yeah, I mean, and then I mean, and then it was funny because it's like I was almost expecting it to be Goodyear. Because, I mean, that was such an early in terms of bringing corporate investment into Arizona. Right. And, you know, that would be an interesting conversation. We, we could, uh, I mean, it's certainly, Goodyear was significant. Goodyear, for, for people who might not know, this was the Goodyear Tire Company. And the reason why they came out here is because of the long staple cotton. 
uh, the cotton that was used to then uh, develop the threads that go into tires, right? Right. And during wartime, they needed lots of tires across right. the planet. Right, right. And because they began uh, growing cotton out in Goodyear, or the, the, uh, the corporation, they needed people who knew how to work cotton. So they brought out African-American workers to live here, as well as Latino workers. They were recruited to, to work the cotton. So that had an impact on, again, the growth of Arizona. But I, you know, I would think, though, uh, Arizona, since the 1960s, think about Barry Goldwater, for example. You know, we've had this reputation up until this past election. We've had this reputation of being a deep red state. And again, if you look at the political map of Arizona, as I said, Pima County, down where Tucson is, blue. Coconino, Yavapai County, up in Flagstaff, uh, northern northern communities, uh, blue as well. It's Maricopa County that's red. And, and because of our large population base, that's what then shifts uh, the overall politics of Arizona. Right. All right. So what took Arizona so long? I mean, it was until it wasn't until 1912 that yeah. we actually became a state. No, yeah. it, you know, for 50 years, uh, Arizona actually holds a distinction of being the longest territory uh, that held territorial status before it became a state. Um, and it was actually this speaking of blue, right? Arizona was too politically progressive in the late 1900s and uh, I'm sorry, the late 19th century and the early 20th century as well. And uh, its constitution was rejected a couple of times. And it was largely because of the, the, the elements that we had in our constitution of referendum, recall, and um, well, what's the other one as well? Um, Referendum recall, and I'm drawing a blank. Maybe one of our viewers can remember what it is, but uh, a direct uh, or your, the ability to recall judges. Um, at the time, it was just too progressive. Uh, it it might have included direct election of senators. I have to go back and double check on that. But anyway, the Constitution was too progressive uh, for the president uh, who vetoed the Constitution. Uh, it's too progressive for for Congress for a while, and. Um, and uh, in order to get admitted as a state, uh, the, uh, the Constitutional Convention of Arizona had the wisdom to delete those passages. And once it, Arizona was admitted as a state, put them back in, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, that was, that was our history for, for a good, good uh, what would that be? Probably 50 years or so of Arizona's existence was that it was, it, it was quite a progressive place. A lot of it had to do with our industry. We had workers, miners, for example. Miners tended to be on the forefront of uh, progressive politics in the 19th century as well. Um, so, yeah, that's why Arizona was took so long to be admitted is because it was too radical, <laughs> too, too politically <laughs> radical. <laughs> so, I, you know, thank you so much for coming on and being our first guest of 2021. This has been such delight. <laughs> um, I'm going to hold you to doing a show in October because I think it. that would be a lot of fun. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll share you with, I'll share with you some of my stories that, that again, that, you know, my my rational brain, I, I have no explanation for why, why these events happen, but I'm happy to share them with you, but thank you so much for inviting me. This was fun. It's fun to sit back and talk history. Uh, with someone yeah, else. exactly. Just kind of chat and yeah. So I, I, I Carol Lee's like, hey, hey, yeah, no, Eduardo has to come back. I'm like, I agree. He okay. needs to come back. So we will make that happen. All right. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. You too. And I want to thank the viewers as well for tuning in. Thank you so much. Indeed. And sticking with us. So, all right. All right. So indeed, because we were to, so in case you were wondering, maybe this show wasn't worth sharing when you first started hearing about it. Maybe now you've discovered, oh my gosh, who knew Arizona history was so much fun. So indeed, so if you haven't clicked on that share button, here's your chance to click on that share button. And so that way all your friends will get to see how much fun we're having. And we get to do this every week which is always so exciting. And so now we're going to go into a segment that's actually sponsored by the first families of Arizona.
You can track them down on Facebook or on their website. And this is Little Arizona. So pre-COVID, I was supposed to be working on a book, Little Arizona. And then during COVID, the publisher was like, well, you know, we're kind of shutting things down. So it looks like it now may be back on track. But what a lot of people don't realize is I grew up in a little tiny town in Indiana, a little farm community of about 25 people. Two roads, one stop sign. Actually, at the end of the at the end of the road where it connected to a big highway, there was a flashing light. And so pretty much my town was kind of a, a bypass by the highway. But that was so I kind of had this whole kind of attraction to those small towns because they are so unique in the middle of a big city to find these communities that have in some ways their own language of how they communicate actually see it was odell attica was the big city close by <laughs> so and see one of the few folks on here who actually has been there so so tonight we're going to talk about a little town called strawberry now, some of you might know more about Strawberry because I saw several folks saying, hey, you know, we're hanging out from the Mogollon Rim. And so one of the things I love about this is the fact that you have a population of about 760 people. It's in Gila County. And it's really on the base of the Mogollon Rim. Now, humans have occupied this area for tens of 10,000 years. Archaeologists have been able to find prehistoric use, including collapsed structures, pits, of pit ovens, dams, and petroglyphs, which you can find all over the place. Even in an urban place like Phoenix, you can still find petroglyphs. And those were really reflecting use um, of the Yavapai and Apache hunters, gatherers, farmers, as well as then the more modern, the stockmen as they would drive their sheep and cattle through the area. Now it is home to Arizona's oldest school, which was built in 1885. It's still standing and you can go take a tour of it. I'm not sure if they're doing tours right now, but, and you know, it's so funny because it's like, I've suddenly, for some reason, strawberry has been popping up in lots of conversations recently about places to go and visit. And so this also really talks about when they discovered gold and you start having now people moving to the area to do mining and they had children and need to educate them. So they built a school. And then Fossil Creek. So the creek that actually had. So Strawberry takes its name from those early settlers when they got there, they found wild strawberries growing. And so that's how the town of Strawberry got its name. Oh, Carolee, I didn't know you used to live in Strawberry. I would have called you up and said, hey, let's chat. And so, yeah, so Fossil Creek is one of two what are termed wild and scenic because you can see, look how amazing that is. And so this water kind of appears almost out of nowhere. And it's basically like 20,000 gallons of water a minute coming through a spring to the bottom that's about 116 feet deep of a canyon. So it is quite spectacular. Um, I did list the Fossil Creek hotline. So if you do want to go visit, you can give them a shout and find out about maybe needing to make a reservation. Is it open right now? So it would be a great thing to do. And there's been a lot of creatives that have been moving up into that area. And so pie bar, which actually just because, you know, I love good pie. I mean, I actually was supposed to be going to wiki up for pie last weekend, but that got derailed. So I'll be doing that again and hopefully making a little video while we're doing that. But pie often pops up in my conversation and somebody was like, oh my gosh, have you been to pie bar? And I've never even heard of pie bar, but some folks moved up to strawberry and opened up Pi Bar. Um, I hear it is now closed due to COVID, but they recently opened up and have become really famous for amazing pies. I mean, it was even someone who from California said, oh my gosh, have you heard about Pi Bar? 
So it's getting really well known really quickly. So I really look forward to being able to go to Pi Bar at some point in the near future and getting myself a cup of coffee and a luscious piece of pie, which I'll need from going through all those hikes and everything else. And then, you know, coming up next week, we have my friend Kenyatta. We are going to talk about Metro Center which was an early mall here in the 70s. And it closed down the end of last year. And it was amazing to see the outpouring of emotion for this mall as it closed. You also have the fact that you, I think the auction is still open. You can go place a bid on things from Metro Center. So... So we're going to have so much fun next week. And Kenyatta is a hoot. So I'm so happy she's going to be on the show. Now, always remember, if you have any questions, stories, or suggestions, comments, please throw them out in an email. You can Facebook me on Marshall Hip Historian. Um, you can shout out to me via Instagram on Hip Historian. Hopefully you see this kind of running theme of Hip Historian. So also, don't forget... Um, the day before Valentine's Day, we have our second Saturday haunted history tour going on in downtown Phoenix. It's about a two mile, two hour loop where we get to talk about a variety of buildings downtown. It's just a different way to look at history and be able to explore our downtown community. And there's what my website looks like. I need to get back on track with it. I kind of took a leave of absence for you know, the new year. So now it's time to get back on track and get some more stuff up there. So you can always keep tabs of me on that. Um, as an outro, actually the intro video was my friend Cole who wrote the music. So that way I could play it because I own the rights to it. Um, my friend Chris who did the video. And as always, my cocktail advisor who I think now needs his own brand that says PJ. Oh, that's right. And I said I would mention the book. So before we get out of here, let's do, if I do that, let's see. So there you can see you. It is Will Barnes, Arizona Place Names. And then, yes, indeed, somebody mentioned that we did talk about Pleasant Valley Wars. That is because Eduardo has written a book on the Pleasant Valley Wars. And my bartender took that and created a cocktail based on that. So that's why we mentioned the Pleasant Valley Wars is because of that. Now, my outro music is done by a Sunny Slope boy who, you know, he's now on the East Coast with his own orchestra, orchestra playing all kinds of cool music. So that's who's going to take us out this evening with then a variety of found film footage. I think some of this may have come from the Library of Congress. Some of it is from my own collection. So again, thank you all. Have a great night. We will see you back here next week. Um, same bat time, same bat channel as we talk about Metro Center and oh, so much more. Oh.